So, my name is Dr. Carmichael, and today what we're going to do is um, we're going to be talking about your research posters. And specifically, what I've designed this presentation for is the front end. So, really thinking about the design and the construction. I'm giving you a couple of tips on content, but then I also want to give you some of those mechanics for developing it. And as I said, don't worry about that with that poll, I'm still kind of learning some of the Zoom uh, features as well, and apparently I did not do that correctly, but it is okay. So let's just dive right in. Um, first and foremost, maybe, I also sing for you, so I hope you enjoy that. Um, <laughs> why are you doing a poster? Well, when I think about which type of platform I'm going to be presenting my research, I'm always asking a couple of questions. First and foremost, I'm asking, what do I want to share? Is the content something that I'm going to be necessarily, I need to be there in order to have a discussion or a conversation, or could it be something that's more freestanding? I'm also asking myself, what kind of venue is the situation I'm going to be present in? Am I going to have a pretty much a, a fixed audience, kind of like we're doing now, or is it something where someone's going to be pretty mobile. And I also think about what stage of development my project's in. Is it something that's complete? Is it something that I've had multiple questions surrounding it? Um, or am I just at the beginning? And when I think about a poster, I think about this as a really an ideal platform when I'm either just beginning, I'm in the middle, or I'm at the end of any kind of research because it offers an opportunity to engage with others and have a conversation. It's also perfect because it's freestanding and I don't always have to be there with it in order for someone to get something from it and engage with me. And this is all if I've constructed it correctly and I've put the right types of information present. So, as I said, posters are for a mobile audience, and these are for people that are potentially, they've all gathered for a particular conference like LSU Discover, or say for Ecological Society of America, where people are milling around, there's certain, like so many hours that are dedicated for this, and you have walls of posters. So this very mobile audience has a lot of distractions surrounding them. And so for you to design a really engaging poster, you want to make sure that it is very focused, um, it's visual, and it's ordered in a way that someone can follow it. And that's the first ideas for setting up your poster and your construction. The second thing to think about is the type of poster you need to create. Now, as an ecologist, I was typically creating original research posters, posters that were designed for my particular question. But that's only one type of poster that you might be able to create or even need to create. You can also think about posters as evaluations. I see these a lot for my students that are in um, the engineering fields where maybe they're doing a comparison of a couple of different um, methodologies or case studies even as I would see in the humanities where they've used different surveys to ask for, um, ask Ask people about their thoughts on a particular issue. No matter which one it is, you can still create a poster, but going into it, it's important to kind of have an idea of which one it's going to be because it dictates the information you're going to include, the place it's going to stay, and it's also going to give you an idea of how flexible you can be with what you place on it. Now, when you're thinking about, you've got your idea of what your poster is going to be, we've decided on a poster, now we really want to center in on what is your question. And the way I think about this is, this is one of the spaces where I start to think about being focused. And I like to use the rhetorical triangle, because by doing so, I can start identifying what my purpose of this poster is. This also sometimes informs the type of poster I'm going to use, but I'm thinking about what is my end goal with this poster? Am I there to inform someone about a particular problem? Am I there to share a particular research with another? Um, is it to uh, share with stakeholders of a community options they have? The purpose is really key because that's going to indicate the types of information that you share. The audience, which I always think is exciting, can be a wide range of different people, different knowledge levels. But the audience dictates how you present it. Um, so language, analysis, or excuse me, um, analogies, 
imagery. So you've got to think about who is your audience, what is their knowledge level, um, and what can I share so that it'll resonate with them and why are they coming to me? What is their need? And lastly, the communicator. So what is it about you that they should be listening to you? What is your expertise? What is your background? And how can you share that? And I'm going to tell you through the communicator, one of the easiest ways in order to uh, state your expertise on a poster is right up at the top by stating your name, your university or lab affiliation, providing your email address, and in this case I would say since we're all LSU students, putting it for LSU, um, that already establishes your expertise. And even more powerful is if you are the first author, because first author means that you are someone who is in charge of the question that was asked. Okay, the next part in kind of figuring out what you're going to place on here is two questions. What do you know and what don't you know involving your particular question and your particular research area? Now, I'm a big fan of identifying knowledge gaps. I find that this is a powerful reflective exercise that you can do anytime, um, anytime really you are in the pursuit of a question. You can also do it for classes. You can do it for any kind of other presentations that you're going to give. But this in particular for research, I like to give this particular set of questions because by answering each one of these, it gives you the opportunity to identify what you know and what you don't know. And making sure that they can get in. So the first question is, what is your area of research and your question? Many of you probably already have this. You probably already have the hypothesis or the issue that you're going to address. But maybe what you don't have is all of the theories or the background information that's really been crucial to establish the pathway it, that your research has taken or the people that have studied that particular area of work prior to you, their pathway to get where you are now. Likewise, one of the most important questions, in my opinion, is the why is this research significant? Now, some disciplines, it tends to be a little bit easier to answer than others, but I'm going to tell you if you can give some time to figure out why this is important, even if you think it's small, it's going to give you a lot of leverage because it will help you, especially in the discussion uh, part, portion of the poster. It's also going to help you in conversation. And so, for example, when I think about the significance of my dissertation work, I think about why I was doing it because it was important to understand why, how to maintain endangered ecosystems and the value that ecosystems bring to the community. And that's when I was talking to someone with, um, within the same area. But if I was talking to a community member, I would sometimes talk to them about whether or not they enjoyed seeing the animals that were in that location or the birds or the insects, the flowers. And that also kind of gave them some importance. If we lost this ecosystem, those particular organisms would go away. Basic research tends to be some of the more complicated reasons we find to say, why is this significant? But sometimes, as simply as just saying, it's the power of knowledge. We don't know how we're going to use this. We don't know how we're going to apply it. We don't know where it connects to the other information that we have in this area. But this remains a question that's not answered. And so by answering it, it gives us power and understanding. And that's why this is significant and important. OK, so what can you do right now? What you can do right now is you can start thinking about and answering those questions and then you can begin to order them up into what I call this story framework. And the story framework was based on um, Hoffman, her book that was called uh, Scientific Writing and Communication. Any of you that are going on in the sciences, and I will even say STEM, this is an amazing text. Uh, gives you a lot of information on um, how to develop your publications and other kinds of pieces of work. But I start off with this framework with the topic, the system, the approach, and the why. And so here you can have these particular questions 
and you can begin to answer them as you go along and it helps you establish that framework of the story. So I've used one of the examples for my own work. When I think about the topic I was studying, I always think about my question, which was how does fire severity influence uh, in an invasive fern in the longleaf pine savanna. My system that I was using to study this was the Japanese climbing fern, the invasive species. I was approaching this particular question by manipulating how much fuel or pine needles were located in certain areas within a longleaf pine savanna. And then the reason that it was important, or one of the reasons I chose to share, was because this was giving us knowledge on how to maintain or how to reduce the presence of this particular invasive species. All right, so we're going to shift a little bit into some of our methodology, and that's what how you're answering the question. I start with the methods because that's something, aside from the question you're addressing, is something that you already have done, and it's sometimes it's the easiest thing to check off your list of tasks to do when you're putting together a poster. So methods can be pretty simple. You want to keep it to the key procedures that you've used. Um, you also it does not always have to be um, text that you include on a poster. Perhaps you can use some kind of diagram or cartoon, as you'll see on the left side of the screen, that gives you some idea of how a, a sample was collected. Perhaps you even use a series of, um, of photos to show that same procedure. Remember, you can use bulleted statements throughout your poster methodology included, but the methods also need to include key procedures. So um, special equipment or analyses that were used, um, any kind of statistical programming, uh, a particular equ equipment or something that you've developed that's unique to this. You can also include other types of, say, uh, procedures that have been well established in your particular area and you can cite them there. Now, what should be included in addition to your methodology is your introduction materials. So I think about the introduction as having establishing the interest and placing your particular question into the context of what is already known. In this section, again, you can have bulleted statements, but this is where you can indicate justification for why this question was being answered, why it there is this question hasn't been addressed and how it's going to apply um, to what currently is known about this topic. Here in this section is where you use citations. Um, and I encourage all of you to look at the citation formats that are relevant to your particular discipline and area so that you can minimize the characters that are present on your screen. I also think about the um, introduction as working backwards in this inverted, um, uh, triangle shape. Big background, we're putting it into the context, we're narrowing it down until we're just answering our specific question. The next thing I want to move into is what you've discovered. So here's where you're going to include all of your results. So I always again start with my main finding first and I also think about my results as the major holder of the real estate of my poster. So your typical poster is about four feet um, wide and three feet in height and so this should be prominent these results. Your results should also be visual if you can. Um, if you can tell your story and your visuals through, um, you can use your visuals to tell your story of your results, it's even more powerful. Um, results should be in past tense because it's things that you've already done and you don't want to put any raw data in here. So for one example could be is, while well, I have included in this graphic, the y-axis has heat per unit area. When I'm giving my results, I'm saying that my increased fuel treatment had two times greater heat released than my unaltered or my control plots. And by putting it into that kind of language, it provides context so that someone's not having to do some kind of calculation of what does this mean, heat per unit area. Now your discussion and your conclusion, it does work backwards. So we're going to move from your specific question, we're giving that particular answer, and then you're providing a summary of your results and then you're connecting it back to what was already known. Um, so here is where you can bring in any other supporting information, maybe how it refutes um, 
as another publication that's been found. This is also a great place to indicate any implications and use for this particular answer that you have discovered. It's also a space where you can talk about maybe things that didn't quite work as well as anticipated. And finally, how you're going to, um, what's the next step? Now lastly, and what I'm showing here is your title. And probably what you're seeing here with your title is very similar to how I said the story of your, or the framework for your poster should be. So the title is something that has to be visual six feet away, at least from your poster. So we're thinking about something very large, but we need to make it a very interesting title. And some of the components and ways to do so is to think about it in terms of the topic, the system, and the approach. So if you can include what is your question, what were you using, and what are you doing as components into your topic, it makes it interesting. For me personally, I like to use a question. So does fire severity influence an invasive fern? And it's pretty simple and it's a question. And if somebody wants to know the answer, they're gonna walk over and get closer than six feet and we can have a conversation. All right, so now what I wanna do is I wanna shift into some construction um, components. Um, and so we're gonna move into a little bit of the basics for what you want to start thinking about as you have that content collected and you have an idea about the size of maybe graphs you're going to use any kind of images that you want to include including some of the bulleted statements how much text do you have for each section so first and foremost when you're thinking about a poster you want to think about where the information should logically fall and for a poster we tend to read from the upper left hand corner and we zigzag down to over to the right bottom. This particular pattern is something we don't want to really deviate with and in fact where I have place information in logical order that's where your title should be up at the top and prominent. In position number one that's either where background, maybe if you want to have an abstract if that's what's required to have on your poster or your introduction goes. Three and four are predominantly where your results sections are. Five is discussion and maybe down in six is where you're putting acknowledgments and um, references. An example of a particular poster layout is one that um, I have been given permission to use from Colin Purrington. And Colin Purrington has a great website for academic poster design. Um, and I'll share that link with you a little bit later. But what he offers is some downloadable templates that kind of give an ideal spacing for the information that you wanna share. So instead of having title, 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 for two lines, you can go in and edit that and put in the relevant information. Now, this is just one example of how a poster layout can be. Each one of you have unique questions that you're answering, and so maybe your results need to be two columns, so a four column poster. Perhaps it needs to be something that's changed from this horizontal layout to something vertical. You want to check with your major professor as well as the conference that you're attending to determine what's the most appropriate layout. But also know that none of this, um, I don't want this to be prescriptive. It doesn't have to be just this way. You have flexibility. Now, once you have your kind of your content, you're starting to figure out what layout might work for best for you, consider using grid patterns overlaying on whatever program you're using to design your poster. Now I will be honest, the posters that I have created have been in PowerPoint. Yes, PowerPoint is designed to do um, this type of presentation. So if you're doing your poster in PowerPoint, you do have to adjust the slides size and I will show you this when that's done. But that said, PowerPoint PowerPoint can be a good use, uh, a good software to use because almost everyone has it. And it also offers a feature where you can lay out a grid pattern across the slide. So you have an idea of how much spacing you have, and then you can orient all of those elements. The next piece to consider is the color that you're going to select. 
and this is both the background color to unify your information as well as if you're going to use colors to code treatments um, or to highlight or draw attention to from of your audience's eye so on this particular slide i've used the total of you know four colors um, of course a dark background with light colored text really pops and works, but the opposite tr is true. A light background with a bright color or um, a dark text works. Now, when you look at this particular slide, I'm going to guess that your eyes all go to that bright yellow square, and that's because it is the brightest on the page. So you also want to keep that in mind is do your color combinations compete with each other and do they result in someone's um, attention being drawn to a particular location. Similar with color is the font style and size. And so as I said earlier, your title should be at visible at least six feet away. And so even in this top banner, you can notice that large text is prominent, you read that first, and your eye gradually goes from the top to the bottom and it goes to smaller and smaller text. That little bitty tiny font, am I getting noticed, is in a 14 point font. So it's quite small, but on a big screen or on a poster, you can still see it. Um, in general, when I think about the size of font for my poster, and this is all in Calibri, so I should note, um, I usually am trying to get a 96 point font size. I'm trying to put my headings in at least a 36, and the body, all of that information, I'm trying to keep at 28 point font. Figures, especially acknowledgements and references, I can go really small with that if I need to, because if somebody wants that information, they're gonna walk up to my poster to get it. Now, it should be noted that the font style matters here. Times New Roman has a, is a serif font, meaning it has those little ends um, at the bottom. Sometimes that's not as easily easy to see when you're doing your presentation or your poster. Um, and it also, that particular font tends to be shorter than say Arial, which is big and tall. Calibri is a little smaller. So these approximations I've provided you are just that, they're approximates. Um, try to go for the biggest font you can when, you, when possible, but make sure that it looks appropriate and it's in balance. And to get to balance, I'm using this particular uh, poster. So the balance of a slide is a combination of the amount of text that you're presenting, the amount of visuals, and the amount of white space that you have that helps organize um, the information present. Now, this particular poster is a four column poster because there was two different components of the question that were being addressed. There's a lot of color in this poster and your eye immediately, at least mine does, goes right to those colorful um, squares. You're also seeing something where the text is smaller, but you would imagine if this was a three foot by four foot poster, it would be easier to read. Um, that said, the titles or the headings are a good size, um, but they, the font in the actual body could maybe have been just a little bit bigger, but it's still pretty much in balance. You also don't see an exorbitant amount of white space. You see just enough. So this means that the information isn't too crowded, but there isn't these big blocks of white space that suggest that information is missing. No matter what kind of images you're using, what kind of visuals, whether it's your um, uh, data tables you've created or if it's pictures that you've taken, do be sure you're using the highest resolution that you can. So I've given you two examples here of the green and null. One that I took in the Savannah, um, which is over a 3000 um, DPI, and then one that I grabbed from uh, Google and then brought it to this appropriate size for this presentation. Now, a pixelated picture does give off an unprofessional 
um, vibe. And it also limits where you're going to be able to take this poster, right? Because if you're showing pixelated pictures, you're just like, oh my goodness, I just going to show it for this one time and I'm going to get rid of this, right? And posters we want to have for longevity. We want to be able to use them in multiple places and multiple spaces. So do go in and try to get the highest resolution picture you can so that it's clean and it's crisp. The other thing that you'll notice here is I've given citation to myself and the other uh, group that had that picture. Plus, you'll notice around these particular images, there's a small border. This particular border is a black border on a white background, and it does make that image really pop, and it looks very clean. The other thing that's important about images that you use is because you've got limited real estate on your poster, you want to make sure that that image really has value and it's holding its weight. So you might want to suggest or use something that's going to give an idea of, say, where you were doing your study. Or in this case, I can show you not only where I was doing my study with a little insert of Louisiana in the upper left hand corner, but I can also have now space to talk to you about the type of fire we were, we were conducting. I can talk about the ecosystem. I can show you wind and direction in this picture. So there's a lot of information that's embedded within it. Now, if this was just some random poster or picture because I really like fire, that shouldn't be on my poster, right? We want to make sure that it is appropriate. And the same thing holds when we're using any kind of data uh, graphs and um, charts. So a lot of times, whatever program you're using will automatically spit out a default graph. Um, and I want you to know that you have ownership of that piece of content and so you should manipulate it so it looks really the best it possibly can on your particular poster or presentation. So in that case, this is something that I did kind of quickly in Excel, but what I did was I moved the the legend from that outside point inside the actual graft area. So now the entire graft area is a square. That's going to mean that it's going to be easier to place in my poster. I've gone around and increased the font size of everything. So the title, if I was going to include it, the X and Y axes, the X and Y axes titles, as well as the actual data points. And then again, I went in and I put borders around those data points so that they stand out. Now I did use a white background on this and that's because I tend to use either a white or a very light um, poster background so then I can manipulate that. I could also change that background to whatever color I needed to based on what color background I choose for my poster. For everything that you include that is both um, publications as well as images, you want to make sure that either they're your own image, and again, they're a high resolution, or you select some kinds of images that are under the Creative Commons licensing license or public domain. And the reason is you're going to take this poster to multiple places. You want to make sure that you're giving attribution to the appropriate people. Now, there's two particular places that I like to go if I don't have an image for something. And that's either Wikimedia Commons, which is a sister site to Wikipedia. The images that are placed on both Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons have to have this Creative Commons license, meaning that those images can be reused. They also give you the how to attribute the particular author uh, or photographer or creator of that image. The second option I like is Flickr. Now Flickr you have to use the advanced search and indicate that you want to see those that are under the Creative Commons license. And I also encourage you to be careful because you still need to look and make sure that that license is appropriate for what you can do with it. Google also has that search advantage and you can go under, I want to see it's search tools. And you can look for images that are free for reuse, but Google doesn't always catch that. And sometimes it'll give you images that do have a copyright. And so be really careful with those that you use. I'm offering you a couple of different resources here um, because I didn't talk about them in this little part of the workshop. The first one is on color science, and it's a little tutorial that you can watch, and it goes all through complementary colors and color selection. The second one is what we just talked about. It's a short tutorial on image use, and it goes more into detail about what to select. And the last one is a, it's a more in-depth uh, poster presentation that I've given. And so you can have that in all three of these are closed caption if you need the captioning to listen to those.
Along with that, I'm offering you a couple of other sources. So I mentioned the Colin Purrington's um, uh, website. This particular um, researcher has a lot of great tips. He also has a pretty interesting blog, um, and I recommend looking through his thing. And then Dr. Falks also has a blog on doing uh, different types of research posters. I'm pretty impressed with those two individuals and some of the tips that they continue to update. So I want to pause it for a second and I'm going to exit out of this program and I'm going to show you to the how to adjust your poster presentation in PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and insert a new slide. And let's see if I can get this to work. Um, I like to go to design and I go to slide size. Now do know I'm using a Mac, so it will be a little different potentially on a, um, a PC. But I select on that slide design and I go to page setup. And here is where I can just select the size that I want for my particular poster. And so I can put in my 56 by 48 size for that particular poster to be. And then when I hit OK, everything gets adjusted. Now, if I were to do that for any of the pictures or any of the images that I currently have on this post on this presentation, what's going to happen is they're going to get really small. Um, I encourage you to do your page setup before you start adding content, otherwise it's going to print out weird and it's going to be uh, unrealistically oriented. The other programs that you might want to choose instead can be um, InDesign, Adobe InDesign. Um, I've seen some people use Inkscape uh, and Poster Genius were some other options that um, people have used to create posters. And then what I'd like to do now is I'd really want to just to kind of open this up to uh, questions that you may have. And if there's something that I haven't um, addressed, I want to make sure that we've got some time where I can help you out with that. So you have a couple of options. If you want to, you can ask me a question in the chat um, or you can uh, unmute and ask me a question. Does everyone feel that they have a good idea on how they can construct a poster, kind of lay out elements where they need to go? Yes, awesome. Glad to hear that. Um, does anyone need to see, has anyone ever done um, any layouts, kind of how to organize and um, have you used the arrange feature if you're using PowerPoint? Would anybody like to see how to do that? Okay, so let's do that then. Because I, please definitely get all your questions out as many as you can since I'm here, um, I am more than happy to do this. So I'm gonna share my screen with you again. And let me arrange it because it's, all right, so if I'm going to add elements onto my, my PowerPoint, and in fact, I'm going to go here. I am just going to copy these and move them onto this slide just for quick bits. You also might see um, it says alt text. Um, if you're going to go and add something. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I don't know if anyone else, I'm only seeing the middle of your screen. Only the middle of my screen. Is that the same training? Oh, now I see everything. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so my camera is here, but it's making me show it on this other side. So you're going to see the side of my face for a second. Um, so I have these particular images on here. And if I want to, we'll just put them kind of in random orders. If I want these all to be evenly spaced, I can, I have some grid lines that pop up and you can kind of see that red line. It gives you kind of an idea. And it tells me they're all in the middle. Do you all see that? Okay, so that's one way you can do it. But the other way you can do it, and let's, whoops. 
give me a couple of these. The other thing that you can do is if I'm going to have a series or a banner across, what I can do is I can kind of haphazardly put these in here, right? And let's first and foremost say that I want to make sure that they're spaced evenly horizontally. It's going to do this based on this particular one over here, where if I've placed it, however close I've placed it to the border, and this one. Everybody else that is in between those two images, when I select them all, and if I go to Arrange, um, I'm going to go to Align and Distribute. And what I can do is I can say I want to distribute those horizontally. So now what has happened is those four images have the same amount of space occurring in between them, and it's all based on those two fixed positions on those outer sides. The other thing that I can do in a range is I can go back and I can say I want to align those to where they are all aligned at the top. So whoever, whichever image is, is the highest, all those other images are going to come up and be aligned to that one. And now since all of these are aligned where I want them, let's say, I'm going to go back to a range and I'm going to group them. So now, if I grab and move, everybody moves together. This is something that takes the pain out of moving and putting together posters. Um, and I try to group as much stuff as I can. And in fact, I'm going to scroll up and show you this particular slide. You'll also see in my notes section, I put a lot of notes in there. And sometimes I've even scripted what I needed to say because someone else will take my, my presentation and they'll give it. Use your notes section for in this particular example um, for these presentations. It's going to help you. But all of this, whoops, not that. This particular element has a couple of different pieces. It's got the circle or the oval and it's got the text, but all of those things are grouped. So when I, oh, not you, when I move this, it all moves together, right? Now I can still go in and I can still move things independently, but in actually all of that's together. Does this make sense? Yes, awesome. Um, this has been something that I think is really important. It has benefited me when I was doing these. The other thing is if I've highlighted something, and particularly when you're doing your poster in that big space, if I go ahead and highlight, I've kind of selected this area, then when I go and start to zoom in, you see the PowerPoint automatically zooms in on that particular area. This is incredibly important um, for you when you're doing uh, that big poster because you can go and locate that particular part. Okay. Any other questions for me? Okay. Sarah, you had a couple of other things that you wanted to share? Yeah. Um, I wanted to make sure that you guys um, all fill out the survey, which I'm going to link here. How do I? Hold on. There. Okay, so um, that is the link to the survey for this uh, workshop. Um, please fill it out. I mentioned it at the beginning of the, the hour. Um, for those of you who need uh, this workshop as a credit for LSU Discover, you'll need to, I've taken attendance, but you also need to fill out that survey. Um, I'm going to share the results with Dr. Carmichael. So, you know, I'll anonymously, but I'll share what you say. So uh, be polite. <laughs> um, but I think that Dr. Carmichael has done a great job um, here today. Um, don't forget Discover Day applications are due this Sunday, April 5th by midnight. Um, if you have any questions, here I'll put my email address here. If you just want to ask me a question privately, 
Um, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't add that to the link. Um, then you can email me. And I think that's, that's it for now. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And yeah, it, you can, you can tell me if there was something that I missed or I didn't, um, it wasn't clear. I, uh, doing these uh, workshops, I always want to know what could have been improved and what we could add to it because honestly, that's the only way I'm going to help the next group that comes in. So I look forward to seeing you on April 15th. And once I stop this recording, I'm going to go through it and, uh, and I'll get it uploaded and I'll share it with, uh, with Sarah so she can share it with you if you're interested. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.